episode of Church and State, commentary on affairs in the state and in the church, which are interrelated and affect each other. I guess our motto would be, as the church goes, so goes the world, and oftentimes as the world goes, so goes the church. What occupies me these days is some litigation in which I've been involved in both the state of New York and the state of New Jersey under the so-called lockdown regimes, which are supposed to limit the spread of the COVID-19 virus. In both cases, New York and New Jersey, we are witnessing something which has never been seen in the history of either state, in the history of the United States, or in the history of the world. There's no basis in scientific fact or in prior epidemiological practice or in prior public policy for what we're seeing in these two states. And what are we saying? We're seeing edicts issued by governors who have no authority to issue these edicts, which tell them when they may leave home, with whom and what number of people they may gather, what activities they may participate in, what businesses they may patronize, what entities they may be involved with, which businesses and entities it may be opened, and which may be closed and forever until the governor says otherwise. In particular, we have this irksome requirement now of the so-called mask mandate, which is my focus today. This idea that people have to have a face covering over their faces whenever they're outside of their homes, unless they can remain six feet away, the magic number of six feet, which came from who knows where, is something we have never seen before in epidemiological practice or in public policy. Not even during the 1918 flu pandemic, which claim the lives of two of the three Fatima seers, did we see anything like a universal mask mandate? There were mask requirements in certain densely populated areas, but never in entire states, and certainly not as some are calling for now, the entire population of the United States of 330 million people. That's simply ridiculous. Now, when you look at the mask mandates in New York and New Jersey, something curious. It isn't actually a mask mandate in either case. Rather, the term that is used is face covering. Why face covering? Well, if you think about it, the answer is obvious. Governors can't really issue an edict mandating that people buy N95 medical grade masks or even surgical masks because they were prescribing the purchase of a product by millions and millions of people, which they have no constitutional right to prescribe. In New York, we're talking about 19 million people. And in New Jersey, we're talking about 9 million people. So the requirement in both states is a face covering. In New Jersey, there's not even an attempt, so far as I can see, to define what a face covering is. It doesn't have to be a mask. Now, medical studies have shown that even surgical masks are little or not at all effective in limiting the spread of a virus through coughing or sneezing and the risk of transmitting the virus just by breathing normally or talking normally is shown by medical science to be minimal, to non-existent. So when you're telling people to wear, say, a bandana or a kerchief or some kind of face covering, whatever that may be, which is not a medical quality mask, you're telling them to do something that's utterly useless. There's just no evidence whatsoever that this silly ritual of requiring people to slap a piece of cloth over their faces whenever they can't be within six feet of other, uh, at least six feet away from other people, it, there's no basis for it. it. It's nonsense. What is it really then? It's a bit to force people to evidence their submission to the dictates of the state in these cases under these lockdowns, which, as I said earlier, we've never seen before in the history of epidemiology or public policy. Now, in New Jersey and in New York, there are curious exceptions to this amorphous face mask mandate. One exception is when you're engaged in strenuous exercise. You obviously can't be expected to wear a face mask or a bandana or a kerchief when you're jogging along. That's too ridiculous even for these tyrannical governors. So you're exempted when you're exercising. Well, when you're exercising, you're expelling air at a very high volume spewing supposedly deadly virus particles into the atmosphere all around you. And we're told by the fear mongers that these particles will hang in the air for hours as an aerosol, like a poison gas. So if someone walks into your viral cloud after you've jogged by, 
he might catch the virus too. Well, that's nonsense. So another exception, when you're eating, there are in both states, New York and New Jersey, permission now for dining outdoors. And in certain regions of New York, you can dine indoors. Now get this, when you're dining in both states, you don't have to wear your mask because obviously you can't shove food for your bandana or your handkerchief, or if you have the money and you want to waste it, the surgical grade mask that you're wearing. So you're allowed to take it off while you're eating. So here you are at your table, indoors or outdoors, and in New York it can even be indoors, eating and chewing and laughing and talking to people across the table from you, because in New York you can have tables of 10, as long as they're separated by six feet. And here you are spewing viral particles into the air, along with food particles and saliva, which people do when they're chewing and talking at the same time. That's perfectly fine. But when you get up from the table, the mask must go back on. So if you want to walk 20 feet to the bathroom after having chewed and laughed and spoken to people at your table of 10, you have to put the mask back on. But then when you come back, you can take the mask off again and start chewing and eating and laughing and talking at the table. And this, of course, is absolutely preposterous. There's also an exemption in both states for schools that are open, special education schools and also summer camps. So nobody has to wear them when they're in a summer camp, a daytime affair, but there are also indoor structures involved in these day camps. And you don't have to wear them when you're in a special ed class. So that's another exception. So even though these masks aren't effective to begin with, because first of all, there's no actual mask requirement, you're just putting a, a bandana over your face, there's an exception even to this meaningless ritualistic requirement. And I know that also that it seems that as the virus declines and the death rates are now in single digits per day in both New York and New Jersey, I believe in New York and New Jersey alike, something like nine people died on July 6th or 7th. There's no longer any statistically significant number of people succumbing to this virus. And yet, as the virus dwindles down to nothing and the pandemic, so-called, is obviously over, they become more and more ridiculous with their requirements. Now, almost six months into this thing, New Jerseyans are told, New Yorkers are told they have to put a face covering on unless they can remain six feet away from everybody. Let's talk in closing about the whole social distancing protocol. And this imp implicates religious worship. Again, the theme of this series is church and state. We're told in New Jersey by Governor Murphy, who is a true and proper tyrant at this point, that another exception to his mask regime, which is not really a mask regime, but a bandana regime, is for a religious purpose. So saith the governor. He says that if you're engaged in a religious activity, you can briefly remove your face covering for a religious purpose. Well, how brief is briefly? Who knows? Is it five minutes, five seconds, 10 minutes if you're at mass? Is it the entire portion of the mass where people are kneeling after the consecration? Or, or what? What is it? And what is a religious purpose? That's not defined either. Suppose your religious purpose is the dignified worship of God without a stupid bandana covering your face, which does nothing. What if that's your religious purpose? The governor hasn't defined religious purpose. So the exemption is, is, is big enough to swallow the rule. What's the bottom line here? The bottom line here is we are witnessing an unprecedented attempt to interfere in virtually every aspect of people's lives, social, political, economic, religious, to tell them where they may gather, when they may gather, with how many people they may gather, for what purposes they may gather, which businesses may open, which businesses must, must close, which entities may operate, which entities may not operate. There is literally no aspect of people's lives that these governors are not trying to control. And of course, they're Democrat governors. In the Republican states, we have relatively modest lockdowns, and those are being lifted. The impact on religion is obvious. There are gathering limitations indoors, very tight gathering limitations. In New Jersey and New York alike, it was 25%. In New York, we were successful in getting a judge to say, listen, you have to allow religious gatherings, which alone are confined to 25%, at least as much space as businesses, which are at a minimum given 50% indoor occupancy. So what we're seeing is a frontal assault 
on the liberties of people, and in particular, their religious liberties. And this is happening at a time when there is less and less justification for indicating to the public that there's a public emergency. Nobody's dying from this virus at this point. And now we hear hysterical press reports about a spike in cases. What does that mean? It means nothing more than now they're testing every Tom, Dick, and Harry who wants to drive to a Walgreens or some other testing location and have a swab stuck up his nose. And they're, they're discovering that millions of people have had this virus and were either mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, which means that the death rate, when you put the numerator above the denominator, the numerator being the number of people who die and the denominator being the total number of cases, when you put one number above the other, you find out that the death rate from this virus is vanishingly small. So what the media hysterically claim is a rise in cases or a surge in cases or a spike in cases is actually good news. But of course, they won't tell you that. And they won't mention the fact that the death rate is declining as the numbers of cases being discovered in the general population rises. So what we are seeing here is something perhaps we never expected. I never expected this from the perspective of this apostolate, which we call the Fatima perspective. We certainly understood that the state was ever more encroaching on our lives, especially on religious and moral life. But we never saw coming the fact that dictatorships would emerge almost overnight on the basis of a virus whose effects are dwindling, even as the tyranny of these governors becomes worse by the day. All we can do is resist with the means at our disposal. We can resist by judicial activity, by bringing lawsuits, as more and more people are doing, as this nonsense continues into its fifth month, and also by the power of prayer. Prayer is the ultimate weapon in this struggle, but meantime, we have to use the human means that are also at our disposal. So let's all hope for a, a good outcome, politically, socially, economically, and spiritually, and for an end to these dictatorships that have been fastened upon us in unprecedented ways in the name of a virus whose effects are more and more being revealed as no worse than that of perhaps a very bad seasonal flu. Well, for Church and State, this is Chris Ferrara. Until next time.